Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Six Five Podcast. We are back, first time in 2023. If you missed us, that's because it was the longest break I think Patrick and I have taken since the first inaugural episode back in 2019. Patrick, after a three-week hiatus, a couple of flights, some cancellations, some cold mountain time, but some good skiing and weather, we are back, baby. Ready? I am so ready, Dan. It's been, uh, it's funny. Uh, I was so excited to go on vacation and then, you know, I enjoyed vacation, but as, as you know, from knowing me, what I do for myself, how long have we known each other? Seven years, eight years? Since 2014. So that's, we're going on nine years, buddy. Yeah. So you know how, like, I'll take a great situation and I'll completely muck it up with, yep. uh, with something different. That's kind of what I do. And, uh, and sure enough, I got myself into some things at the end of the year that, that are good things, right? Uh, you know, properties and kind of figuring out taxes and, uh, you know, trying to find out ways to give more to the federal government and, and stuff like that. But, um, no, you say how to give more, is that what you're working with? Well, you know me, I'm just, I'm just trying to be funny and sarcastic, but, uh, no, we're back and I'm, I'm feeling really good. Uh, I don't, I think there's one person in the office floor that I'm in right now. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if I maybe did something wrong or, or something like that, but we're here, we're doing what we love to do, which is, you know, my business model is very simple. Uh, we advise and we educate, and this is the education part of it. So we back. So we back. Let me, let me tell you why you're alone in your office, because this is one of the weird years where all the holidays, because you know the Christmas, New Year's always a week apart. Yeah, they fell on the weekend. So, in order to make sure that all uh, worker uh, folk got a full day off, they made the following Monday a federal holiday. So now we are getting an extra day off, and for a lot of people, that is really nice. But as business owners, and when you've been out for a while, sometimes this new year kind of brings this blended feeling of rejoice of, hey, we finished another year, and holy crap, we have to get going again. And it's getting that rev, you know, those revs back up and the motor going. And I don't know about you, Pat, but after New Year, it's like, okay, I'm good. I've had some quiet time. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to hear from customers again. I'm ready to talk to people. I'm ready to talk to our teams and, and get the year started. And then you get this one more day where it's like, crap, no one's working. <laughs> so, so I'm just writing emails and firing them off in every direction. I'm sure the team really appreciates that. Yeah, they always do. I mean, I, I was really appreciated when my my boss would send me emails <laughs> over vacation. I come in, it's like 12 feet, uh, 12 feet deep. But, yeah, they don't, uh, they don't actually appreciate that. So listen, we're going to do something a little different today. You know, you and I talked over break and the end of the year you know our show the six five is always about six topics round five minutes each uh biggest stories in tech little news lots of analysis lots of opinion of course our opinions get stronger as time goes on but uh you know the end of the year there there aren't a ton of announcements we all know ces is coming and you and i'll be there and we'll be covering it fast and furious but we said what about a reflection moment here you know a lot of us write our trends pieces or we'll write predictions or we'll write um, kind of what were the big things. But on this, we haven't historically done a show in the past, Pat, where we kind of say, well, what happened in the last year? And maybe a little look forward. So we decided let's do a best of 22 and a look at heads 23. But we would just kind of do a quick down the line. It would be best events, best announcements, best. We did a hardware award. We're going to do a software award. We're going to do a flop because we love to talk flops. And then we're going to make a few 2023 prediction. We'll get started in a minute really quickly beforehand. Just a reminder for everybody, this show is for information and entertainment purposes only. And while Patrick and I are regularly cited and, and all over the media for our opinions about tech companies and sometimes even our opinions about stocks and markets and performance, don't take anything we say as investment advice. We are industry analysts. We look at the tech space and we provide our best thoughts and analysis on what's happening Pat, let's start off with something that we're about to get back to. We're about to get back on the road, back on an airplane, back in a hotel. And you and I are professional event attendees. So we're 2022. What is your, who is, who's your award winner 
for best event and why? Yeah, I sometimes joke that uh, we are industry analysts, our professional event attenders. And I think I spent 42 weeks on the road uh, this year. Uh, so, yeah, I we attended a, a lot of events. And, you know, this is a tough one. You know, of course, I want to say, hey, you know, the 6-5 Summit is the best uh, event that 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 I ever went to. Hey, there's Bill. He uh, Bill just came in. How about that? Hey, Bill Bill Ruff. Huh? I said, hey, Bill. What's up, Bill? Thanks for coming, buddy. I'll see you uh, see you tomorrow on the plane. See you, bud. Uh, see you, Bill. That was fast. But best event. It's a tough one, right? I mean, Qualcomm had some really good events. Uh, the one in New York, uh, uh, the one in Hawaii. Uh, heck, IBM Think. Best um, small event uh, that I went to when events came back. But I got to tell you, I'm going with Cisco Partner Summit. And the reason that that I gave it that was, first off, executive, senior executive accessibility is, is big for my determinations uh, on technology and companies. It's just the, the, the way that I roll, I sorry, the way that I roll. Um, and literally nearly every senior executive staff member was just at the cocktail hour. Right. I think Chuck was the only person on the staff who, who didn't show up, but he came in and talked to the analysts and, you know, I got, got to, to chit chat uh, with him. So that's, that's absolutely um, huge for me. So I got to hand it uh, to the folks at Cisco. Uh, good job on that event. And here's the funny part, Dan, and maybe it's because I wasn't expecting it to be a good event. Right. Cause I like tech. And I like announcements and they rehashed a lot, but it kind of got me, got me center lined, but you know, me and, and, and execs, I, I like the senior exec thing. That's, you know, I can, I can smoke them out right. Uh, after a 15 minute conversation, uh, I do respect the products and everything coming out, but I kind of get what I need from the senior execs. Absolutely. And, and I didn't attend that one, but I do remember you coming back. I even think on one of our episodes here, you were sort of glowing about it. And, and again, as professional event attendees, um, we really do get a sense of what's good and not. And so it's hard to kind of streamline it down to one. And you actually already, you already gave my pick away, but before I give my pick, I did, I did want to give a little bit of context. I didn't get, I didn't give your pick um, away. Well, you, you mentioned who I picked when ah. you discussed uh, the ones that you liked. And so, you know, the criteria I think is different for, you know, overall best. I guess it's a little bit of all these things. You mentioned one thing. I do think executive access and, and either one-on-one -on -one or small group time is very important. I think um, time value is super important. How many days do we have to spend to get what we need? Because when you're in as many events as we are, there's a combination of this nice to be back in person, but there's also this other side of like, hey, let me get the info and get on to my next thing. <laughs> yeah. Another is location. I mean, where are you doing the event? So you mentioned Hawaii. I mean, obviously great event. Of course, the downside is it takes like a full day, day and a half to get to and from. So if you can feel good about sacrificing the time, waking up in Hawaii is never a bad thing. And of course, there's other parts around the world that we go to events that are really great. Another thing, Pat, you didn't mention that I really weigh heavily is treatment of us as analysts. Huge thing for me is like certain events, um, you're basically treated no different than any other attendee, which again is fine. But when you do as many events as us, I think having a little extra love, good meals, good uh, having a lot of coffee available, making sure that people are handling you, getting you to your meetings. Um, and so there were some great events like that. Like, you know, for instance, Salesforce, Oracle, do great jobs of that kind of stuff. But my pick, IBM Think, you mentioned it. I fell in love with this smaller event this year. Yeah. I fell in love with smaller, more intimate events. And I really enjoyed AWS reInvent Pat and doing all that. But that size of that event creates stress for me. When you can do an event that was kind of in a small location, a small place, get access to a ton of executives, get in and get out together. I think that was like the that was like the perfect storm of activity time, executive access, and, and, and handling of us that I just would love to see more events like that. And I don't know that companies can get a good return at scale doing events that small, but for analysts, it was perfect. And so 
Um, Pat goes with Cisco Partner Summer. I'm going some summit, and I go with IBM Think. Let's go on to announcements, best of 2022. So Pat, 21 brought a ton of strain on the supply chain, and nothing uh, was more touted as a problem for uh, the supply chain than the chip shortage. Vehicles, PCs, servers, um, gaming consoles, refrigerators, ovens, basically you name it, you could not get it. And that was because we had a massive problem with our ch chip manufacturing. Um, so over the course of the year, the, uh, you know, the semiconductor industry, the CEOs of many of our, our, our clients, customers, um, policymakers had all come together to basically uh, try to put a bill forward. And Pat, as much as it seemed obvious for the sake of national defense, uh, for uh, supply chain resiliency, for technology leadership, there was a period of time where it really didn't look certain that uh, we were going to get this bill passed. And so the Chips and Sciences Act, over $50 billion dollars, uh, plus another couple hundred billion potentially for other innovation R&D. We talk a lot about lack of the research part of research and development to help the United States build a greater resiliency um, in the semiconductor space finally passed. Now, this was the great news. I'm going to be a little bit of a Debbie Downer on my best of and just say, sadly, the passage was really the beginning, not the end. And there's so much work left to be done. Um, I expect Intel to step up in a big way to add to the manufacturing capacity. But that, uh, of course, Intel has had a tough couple of years and the market is not as bullish on Intel as it might want to be. Um, you know, we see TSM, we see Samsung, we see a number of fabulous all with hands out looking for money. Um, you know, we've got the likes of IBM, Global Foundries. But in the end, the passage is the beginning. It was a great start. I'm very excited. We need to make more chips here and more chips outside of Asia. What's going on in Taiwan and China is scary. You should be afraid of what's going on. Don't be distracted by Russia and Ukraine. <laughs> the real scariest uh, conflict in our world right now is in China. But the passage of the act is the beginning. We're two to three years away from really seeing a benefit. And we do want to see the money go to companies that will keep it here domestically and in safe parts of the world, and that will add real resiliency to both leading and lagging edge. Because a lot of our continued delays are actually 14 nanometer and higher, and we really haven't solved that problem yet at scale. Pat, what's your best announcement for 2020? Yeah, so first off, um, we did, didn't collaborate on this going in, so I didn't know what you were gonna pick until, I don't know, a few hours <laughs> ago. And that and, that, and that was a and that was a really good one. I almost wish I would have chosen it, but, uh, you know me, I'm a product person. So I think I thought product announcement, right? Like what products were. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe I was cheating. I came up with something that was easy, fun and broad. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's good. And 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 for a second, I thought you were going to pick like TSMC's disaster Arizona uh, announcement event that they did out there. They got hijacked by uh, by uh, POTUS. Uh, for his union union talk, but uh, anyways, <laughs> no, I I chose a different one, and and the way that I, uh, you know, I always say one of the things I enjoy most about being an industry analyst is I get to do what I really enjoyed a lot and a lot more when I was in I was in the business, and that's participate and be part of a bunch of announcements, and that can either be part of an advisory role up front or a market education role. Uh, outbound and, and outside voice. And I really liked IBM, IBM's quantum roadmap at, at Think. And maybe we'll, well, wait a second, Pat, that's like, you know, not reality or, or blah, blah, blah. But uh, best announcement to me, it, it uncovers things that I was always wondering about the company or about the uh, the technology. So IBM has chosen a, a technology uh, on quantum that people are like, hey, how do I scale this thing? That's a challenge. And B, how do I increase the uh, the quality of, of, of the qubits? And quite frankly, they, they answer both of those questions. It was just a kind of an aha moment, right? They've talked about the research on increasing the the quality uh, of, of of the qubits, which you know, um, I, I think has been a a a challenge uh, for IBM, particularly for scaling. Because if you don't have the quality of the qubits, then you have to create 
a bajillion more uh, qubits to get there. And the other thing it answered uh, for me was, was on, on scalability. And that's not only scalability inside of the, I don't know if you want to call it a trap uh, or, or something like that, but, but it's more of the chip. So whether it was, you know, Flamingo, Kookaburra, uh, or, or something uh, like that, Heron and, and Crossbill, they showed not only how you could scale on, on a smaller version, I'll call it the semiconductor version, but also connecting multiple systems uh, together. So that's why I choose um, IBM's quantum announcement that they did at Think for my best announcement of 2022. Hey, and listen, Pat, um, bringing some real world and real life to quantum is a big deal. In 21, it felt like there was a lot of quantum bullshit. Uh Uh-oh, now we got the advisory sticker. Beep. Anyways, but there was a lot of kind of like, you know, we're going to go all, but in 22, I think as the market gets more practical, getting more practical matters. So it was a really big announcement. And so... I think uh, don't undersell it because uh, quantum is going to become a very important part of our world in the next two to 35 years. Um, <laughs> Pat, <laughs> I, 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 I caught that. I caught that. Okay, I, was, I was making sure. Wait, wait, right. wait. Um, let's go into something. Let's go into our best tech performers. We did, uh, we're going to have two. We're going to have one on uh, hardware and infrastructure and one on uh, more software. Uh, let's start with hardware. Um you get the you get the first shot at this one. Yeah, this one's so hard. And isn't it funny? Like everybody, nobody wants to say that they're a hardware company anymore or infrastructure, right? Every hardware company seems to want to call itself a solutions company. And the only companies who who still take pride in the in the iron are are chip companies. So this one was a hard one, right? You've seen what IBM has done, AMD, HPE, Ampere, Ventana Micro. Uh, uh, Frore uh, systems uh, on on the yeah. CPU and cooling side, but I, I had to pick uh, AWS uh, for uh, for this. And you know, we you and I might be in alignment. I don't want to you know steal anybody's thunder, but he, here's why I why I picked it is in a world where people think that infrastructure doesn't matter, uh, AWS uh, pounds its chest and is very proud of it. And not only is it uh, horizontally integrated and how it connects different um, services together, service storage, network security, everything horizontally, but also vertically when it comes to um, chips. I mean, even chips, I mean, they have homegrown CPUs, they have uh, homegrown uh, network and security offload. They have uh, Inferentia with, with inference. They have Trainium with, with training. Uh, in AI, I mean, you want to go all the way down to down to the freaking bare metal uh, on something you can. Um, you want to, you know, I know this isn't part of the infrastructure part, but you want to go all the way to the top and abstract all the goo uh, with that application. Uh, they they can offer that as well. The other thing that I appreciate is even though they do all their homegrown uh, 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 chips, they also have these amazing relationships. Uh, with the the folks like uh, Intel and AMD and Nvidia, and you might ask, how can somebody do that? Right? They're 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 competing with them. Why? Because AWS has such a commanding lead inside of cloud infrastructure. Uh, you have to work with them. You want uh, to work with them uh, because they're they're so big. And unlike Azure, whose biggest customer is itself. Right. And Google, whose biggest customer is itself with its with its, with its uh, SaaS properties. That's that's not the case uh, with AWS. That is that is hardcore uh, infrastructure uh, as a service, 24 uh, by 7, 365 days a year. Yeah, this is one of those rare moments, Pat, where with no pre-planned alignment, we landed in the same place. Uh, And by the way, for me, it wasn't close. And I don't want anyone else out there to take this personally. It's just AWS continues to set the pace for the infrastructure as a service layer. And of course, they're getting more and more compelling every notch up that stack. But the other parts are where I feel the other cloud providers are more competitive when you get to the platform software and services. 
but the infrastructure, and to be clear, something we've talked a lot about is the desire to commoditize the infrastructure versus the reality of the infrastructure is not commoditized is probably one of the most missed things. You mentioned all the great partnerships, all the varying instances, all the homegrown silk and all the different offerings that um, AWS has been able to roll out. It's just incredibly compelling. It doesn't mean um, I don't continue to believe that uh, the Googles, the IBM plus Red Hats, the, um, you know, Broadcom VMware plus any cloud isn't going to make a, you know, again, some of these will work right with AWS, but AWS as a complete holistic offering for infrastructure uh, just continues to set the pace. And by the way, it's a $20 billion a quarter business now. It continues to grow at mid double digits, um, rolling out more and more uh, compelling offerings every quarter. The list of stuff this company is rolling out on a quarterly basis, it should impress anybody. And so it wasn't actually hard for me. Um, again, you know, you and I, we, we are, we, we struggle sometimes to give one because we have, you know, we have so many children and we love them all, I joke. But in this case, Pat, I think you and I can agree. And there really isn't much more to say. I hope AWS continues to set a pace that continues to bring up these other cloud providers, Oracle, IBM, Google, Microsoft, because the world will need more cloud in the future. So yeah, that's and AWS. And, they, and, and, and AWS does have risks, which you and I have talked about. I mean, this multi, multi-cloud thing, um, uh, I think uh, could be a risk if they don't address it, at least at least the messaging uh, part of it. Uh, on-prem cloud uh, from the likes of, you know, HPE and, and Lenovo and IBM, um, you know, I think are, are threats too, but 20 billion a quarter, okay? At just ridiculous margins, ridiculous yeah. in, a, in, in a good way. Yeah, no, it's Pat. I think there's a reason we both picked it. No, no, uh, no consultation between us. Um, that's a pretty safe indicator that it landed. So the next one is a special award. It's called the uh, Back to the Front Award, which is my favorite, uh, which is Pat and I's inside joke about how we talk about uh, software systems that connect the back end of an operation to the front end. It's the ERP to the CX. And um, while we're not necessarily only talking ERP and CX here, it is our best tech performer in the software space. I've been talking relentlessly about deflationary technology uh, with our economy heading into recession. I thought Bill McDermott, a uh, guest of our Making Markets pod, um, did a tremendous job with ServiceNow. And I picked them as my best back to front award because this is a company that is building uh, the, the technology that allows companies to both with existing and new cloud instances to automate so many of their workflows. And as companies are trying to figure out how to right size their ships, get rid of- uh, Right size their what? Right size their ships. Oh, I think it's something else. <laughs> well, you know, probably for some of the businesses, that's what it is. Um, they right size their organizations. They're trying to you know, they threw a lot of bodies at problems temporarily. A lot of people gave credit to companies in making these massive digital transformation when really it was just lots and lots of worker bees uh, doing a lot of things um, to meet this relentless demand. And now that demand is falling off, um, companies are going to need to figure out how to get their most from their infrastructure, most from their software, most from their cloud, most from their edge deployments, most from their data. In order to do that, they're going to need to build automations. They're going to need to use uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. They're going to need to build workflow automations. They're going to want to do it without having to completely lift and shift all of their software uh, and systems. And so ServiceNow is just one of those companies that has built a very compelling set of, of uh, software capabilities to enable companies to layer cloud-like capabilities on top of both prem and uh, true cloud instances and get more by automating workflows, taking your data, maximizing it, and getting more from the uh, investments that you've already made. For me, it was a pretty easy pick. Um, there are a lot of good software providers, but the con company's continued growth close to the rule of 50 plus, even 60 at times, um, throughout a difficult pandemic uh, has really impressed me. And I don't see any other company coming up quite as clearly and able to compete in this exact space 
So not only do I think it's going to be a best of 22, but I think it has a real shot of winning this award in a year. Wow. Wow. I said a shot. I'm not saying they're going to win. I'm saying it has yeah. a shot of winning this award in a year. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I mean, ServiceNow wasn't even on my wasn't even on my radar screen, which might uh, – this conversation might uh, get them on there. But listen, <laughs> I, I – this one was tough and I took, you know, you know me, I took you a little bit literally on the back to front award because you had to pick somebody who could connect the front to the back. And there's only, you know, you know, tough competition out there is Microsoft or Zoho uh, and there's there's Oracle, right, that are connecting the front end to the back end uh, that have, you know, that front end CX piece, but also that ERP piece uh, on, on the back end. And heck, I, I went with Oracle. Right. I mean, not only do they have one offering that does this, which which are the fusion apps that are uh, in a SaaS model, they also have NetSuite. <laughs> right. So uh, for small businesses that are you know going to about to go public and and for the bigger businesses, you have, um, um, you know, you have fusion, I think the. The only criticism that that you might be able to cast on Oracle is the strength of its CX and marketing. But you know, as we've seen, I mean, even Salesforce has had its challenges uh, in 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 some of those areas. And by the way, let me read off some of the. I know this isn't a financial uh, discussion, but you know, last uh, last quarter, uh, fiscal twenty twenty fiscal twenty three second quarter, Q two cloud application SaaS revenue up forty percent in us dollars as a lot of folks were choking on 14 12 percent uh growth and you know we don't pick a lot you know just just for that and heck erp rocking in it at, at, at you've come to appreciate from um netsuite 25 percent growth right so i give mine to oracle and this is another one that could potentially I think could parlay this into 2023. We're going to have to see. Yeah, it was a good pick, Pat. Um, Oracle had a great year. And like I said, they've really, what, now a 10 plus billion dollar cloud business. Um, solid growth. I, I was on, uh, I did squawk picks last week while you were uh, in Aspen. That's not, uh, by the way, when you get west of, uh, of the central, uh, squawk box is not a, it's a, it's a night show, not a morning show because <laughs> it's so early. But um, I actually picked Oracle on my list too. Um, and one of the reasons I picked is because beyond the 75 or so percent of their business, that's all recurring. The company's just done a, a good job. It has done a very solid job with its SaaS cloud and apps business. So I think uh, that's a good pick. And by the way, a better by the letter of the law, back to front. But what I would say is the automations I was looking at could connect the back and front of any system. And that's what ServiceNow can do. No, I think so, it's good. And this conversation uh, might, might get me to pay attention a little bit to ServiceNow. We'll see. So let's have some fun, Pat. Let's, you and I both like to make some rips where we can. And, um, you know, I didn't even know how to make this a best. So I called it the best flop. Um, what is our worst of 2022? And by the way, there are many to choose from, some horrible picks, some horrible uh, media coverage, uh, some horrible opinions out there. What is the most horrible of tech for you this year, Pat? I mean, this is hard. I mean, and I hate to say this. I, When I was in my 20s and I looked at industry analysts, I always said, I don't want to be them, right? I don't want to be these people who just have bad attitudes all the time and uh, but I do like to talk about flops because it kind of keeps us honest and it keeps us us pure. And there were so many. I mean, my gosh, whether it's, you know, FTX, uh, whether it's TSMC's Arizona uh, event that that turned into a union event um, and kind of squeezed out all the all their design customers. Um, there was the all in summit that was just a complete bummer as well. But my Best flop, the worst of 2022, is how Apple treated its uh, iPhone workers in in China, in uh, Zhengzhou. 
And whether it was security guards beating them with metal rods. I mean, we thought it was bad at a Foxconn facility when they had anti-suicide nets uh, out there. Right. And there was some investigation on that. And then there was investigation of child labor uh, that uh, that was in this. But my, my, my biggest flaw is a combination of the delta between what you think of a company and when you think of Apple and how they kind of pretend that they make no mistakes. They're they're for the end user uh, power to the end user as opposed to power of the. Uh, most valuable company on on the planet, uh, putting your suppliers out of business. Uh, I mean, it's just an ugly, ugly company. Not paying your suppliers to the point where they have to lay people off and impacts family lives. But this one takes the bill. And and I, I don't think I'll forget these workers getting beaten. I thought they were just plastic rods, which is 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 a pretty well known technique in China to kind of keep people in order. But these these were metal rods that they got uh, that that they got uh, uh, beaten with. So that's my worst of. Congratulations, Apple. I knew you could do uh, it. I had no doubt that you would find um, some some sanctity in picking something Apple did that was just gratuitously uh, horrible. Gross. And yeah, gross is a good word. It's funny, Pat, because uh, it's, a, you know, I, I try to stay away from things that are too polarizing. I, I tend to play these lines well, and you know that, but this is one of those areas I struggle to not speak of. And I really struggle because it's amazing the things that people put forward as, you know, violations of human wellness and rights, but yet somehow we can have workers indentured slaves. I mean, God, we had a lot. Like, I loved watching the World Cup, but, man, there were some horrific human atrocities in the process of building those stadiums. And it's, like, all good. And I guess for whatever reason with Americans, as long as they keep slapping those iPhones together, nobody cares how it actually happens, which to me is, is why I realize we never will solve our biggest issues when it comes to taking care of other humans because it's only when it conveniences us that we seem to take note. Um, so that's a good call out. Mine is less uh, horrifying and sad, um, but it is actually something where I can look back and say I missed. I, you know, when I pick trends, you know, I guess I, the market was already capitulating end of last year, but I still thought the metaverse sort of had this momentum that was going to see through. But boy, did we see companies pull back on their metaverse talk in 2022. I mean, by the second half of it, it became nothing more than digital twins. And maybe a little bit of VR gaming was all that's left after, you know, endless crypto, blockchain, Web3, disaggregation, decentralization, websites were going to be decentralized, banks were going to be decentralized, there was going to be no more cash, only crypto. And then, you know, you had Bernie Madoff 2.0 come out with Sam Bankman Free. I mean, that's pretty horrific. Um, Meta, I mean, that company literally took a hard right pivot right to the toilet. It was like, hi, you know, we are, we're at the penthouse suite. Can you find me a toilet where we can flush ourselves? Because that's what Mark Zuckerberg's strategy was, completely um, disjointed from what was going on in the real world to decide in the middle of what looked like a rate raising environment, high inflation, let's pivot the business away from what we do well and where we make profits and go down a path that we have no idea if anybody's gonna buy into. At the cost of what? I think Pat, we've lost like six trillion dollars now, not just Meta, but in terms of market cap because of what happened in the economy. And, and Meta basically just put its foot on the gas and said, How much faster can we lose shareholder value? I mean, they were down 70 plus percent. This is a this was a name that people's retirements were in, their 401ks were in. This is not a name of a high risk low profit growth stock, but this was a company that took on its own leisure, got lazy, overhired, didn't make cuts, and then pivoted off of its core business after Apple had already destroyed its uh, market valuation on its own accord. So I give the award to Meta, but I further give the award to, we have 10 years of effort to build this Web3 idea, got set back by 20 because of all the bad actors, all the bad policy, and of course, the lack of real practical applications for the metaverse. 
Um, so screw you, Meta. You hey, I got a question for you. Do, do you? Uh, I'm do you kidding. Put, do you put do you put Metaverse and crypto in the same place? Blockchain. You know, most a lot of crypto uh, crypto exchanges, or you know, a lot of decentralization, a lot of projects that are on crypto or run on blockchains. Things like um, uh, Render, where you got like you know disaggregated networks of uh, of GPUs that are being dis distributed over a blockchain. These are crypto running on a crypto project running on blockchains, all part of this sort of Web three decentralization. So. Yes, yes, Pat, the metaverse itself still has some apps. You and I both like things like what NVIDIA is doing with um, digital twins, um, autonomous, uh, you know, uh, training that can be done for, for vehicles. There are applications, but this stuff all got coupled together. It was supposed to change the world. And most of what we got in 2022 was a heaping pile of shit. Um, it's kind of funny. So I, I, I'm wondering... I kind of have this this notion that all all of this hype was just to get people to invest and to to get startups to 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 pull the trigger. And I, I never thought we were close. You know, it, it's weird. Never. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm uh, I'm a bit disillusioned, and you can hear in my 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 cussing and pouting that um, I might have lost some money in crypto this year. Um, <laughs> I remember you telling me too. Hey, every week, baby, I'm in. I'm still doing it, by the way. Um, so I'll make a, a fun, let's flip to our 2023 predictions. This is not my prediction, but I will make one for sports. Coming out of all my whining about Web3 Crypto and Metaverse, Bitcoin has not seen its all-time high yet. That is a That is my fun but not my real prediction. Come on, right, you man. go first on the twenty twenty. You can't do that because you'll get credit if it happens, and then if you won't get punished if it doesn't. Well, I never get punished if it doesn't. Do you think I'm ever going to refer back to any of my wrong predictions? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good and so honest. I appreciate you. I've made uh, so many. <laughs> so you want me to jump in here? On uh, no, I mean, yeah, you, you kind of gave your you kind of gave. Hey, I'm going to give my, I'll give a throwaway one first. The Broadcom will acquire uh, VMware. So that's, that's my, that's my. Yeah, we can do a rundown of throwaways. And then, and then Twitter, I think, uh, I think Twitter is going to rise from the ashes. Uh, but, but no, overall, my big prediction is this whole notion uh, of practical innovation, ESG and, and, Let's throw DEI in there uh, if if we want. So we had essentially for, gosh, eight, seven years, near zero interest rates and money was free. Uh, we had the pandemic to hit, uh, which, right, we shut down, which shut down people's ability to work um, and create stuff for the most part if you were in the tangible world. Uh, those of us uh, in the non-tangible world, non-factory, right? We could work from home. And then we poured trillions of dollars we gave away for free. We printed more money. Uh, and, and here we are paying for it, right? We have high interest rates uh, driven by the Fed activity that, that was in there to lower inflation that was driven by all the free money that, that we give out. And Heck, I think there were 3 million U.S. workers who just decided I'm not even going to go back to work. Uh, either they were comfortable in their parents' basements or they had enough money to kind of ride through that or they just, you know, decided to, to give up. So where I'm at now is growth isn't in vogue. Uh, EBITDA is. And I think that that's true for startups. Uh, but I also think that that's going to be even more true for uh, bigger companies out there. So I think we're even the biggest companies, right? The trillion dollar companies are going to get away from innovation for the sake of growth into practical innovations. You're going to see some projects that are going to get cut. You're already seeing uh, these, these big companies get rid of it. So practical innovation that has a clear line of sight 
uh, probably going to get rid of some of the risky, riskier types uh, of, of ventures. And I also think, you know, you're sitting there, board of directors, let's uh, bring in some ESG action. If ESG, now, first of all, I just want to say that uh, love it or hate it, the pressure is on boards of directors to hit their ESG targets. I, I don't want to debate uh, those targets and whether they're going to save the planet uh, or not. All I'm going to say is that the, 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 they're real. What I do know is that if you are hitting your ESG goals, and not hitting your financial goals, you will be tossed. Uh, so this practical ESG, uh, I think, will will come in. And I, and I think, you know, we've talked to Dan and you and I have talked to some, I think, very insightful uh, CEOs uh, like Darius, uh, Darius Adamchik uh, and Arvind Krishna that, quite frankly, supply a lot of the companies in manufacturing and, 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 and warehousing. And uh, I think that uh, this notion of ESG for ESG's sake is not going to be in vogue next year, but good for the environment, good for the business, I think it's going to work. So that's where I think we uh, are moving. And by the way, I hope we're going to see some uh, big um, breakthroughs in fusion uh, energy. That would be amazing. Mini, mini nukes. That would be great. Yeah, maybe that, maybe a little crisper in the process. So I'm going to, I want to, I want to, we're going to do a bonus uh, Twitter section at the end here, but I want to finish with a, with a more non-controversial 2023 prediction. Um, and by the way, I liked yours a lot because I, I've been using the words economical or practical um, ESG for some time. So I couldn't agree with you more, Pat. Did I just um, lift did, did, did I just steal your? I'm no, not giving you credit. No. You know me. I, you know how it works, though. I come up with quips that have no solid backing, and you actually give all the backing, and then we come out of meetings, and I get all the credit because I gave the one liner. You know. <laughs> By the way, there, for the record, there was something a call we were on in the last week of the year where. I did you hit the quip home run? Did you hit the I, quip? I got run? the quip. I got the home run. All right, all right, all right. All right. I, better together, buddy. We know this. this is I know, I do. Um, so I, I I call it it's the year of hashtag better together. It's the year of iteration over innovation or iteration of innovation. In a down economy with all the things that you talked about, high interest rates, high inflation, job cutting, economic uncertainty, companies are you know, Arvind Krishna, we mentioned, said that he thinks IT is the most protected line item in any budget, but budgets are still smaller. So you have a 20% smaller budget, it may be protected, but you're still going to see that 20% go across the organization. Um, companies are going to try to get more out of the technology they've already bought. I've mentioned this a few times on this pod. I mentioned this uh, last week on a few different on, uh, interviews I did on TV, but I like names like IBM, Cisco, Dell Infrastructure, HPE, Oracle, SAP, just as a few names that will do really well. And that's because companies are going to need to do more with their current infrastructure, with their servers, their storage. Um, they're going to need to do more with their data. They're going to want to do more with their existing software deployments. They're going to want to uh, do more to secure their environments. Um, and these kind of core IT companies, they were less cool. They didn't go up a ton. They never saw their PE uh Ratios swell up to 60 or 100 or 200. Um, most of them saw very uh, conservative growth, but you saw IBM reach an all-time high late in this year, or sorry, 52-week high. I'm not sure if it was all-time. 52-week high. We've seen companies like Cisco. Dell's infrastructure has done really well. HPE's GreenLake keeps growing. We saw, you mentioned, Oracle's solid growth and SAP's cloud growth. This is because companies are going to be like, well, we were going to lift and shift. We were going to make a big strategic move, but you know what? We're going to wait a year. We're going to wait two and that means double for these companies because one, it means the budget shifts from whatever that new project was back to them. And two, it gives these companies more years to stay sticky and to keep those customers in the longer term as, as they continue to innovate on the technologies they have, even as new and exciting data and cloud providers come into the fray. So I think in 23, until we see some really clear signs that we're going to return to growth, we're going to return to near or very low interest rates, and you're going to start to see that uh, that uh, slingshot for those kinds of companies. 
It's going to be these solid day in, day out companies that are going to do really well. So one more, let's do one more little, little outro prediction set here, Pat. Um, you know, you did mention Broadcom VMware, so I'm going to say the Microsoft Activision deal will get done too. Um, uh, I think you and I agreed on that one. Let's just talk about Twitter, okay? You and I are probably not going to make a ton of friends here, but I listened to, uh, you know, the All In pod this week. I don't know about you. And then guess who showed up? Because obviously David Sachs and Elon Musk are clearly close. Um, I think David was in the Twitter building <laughs> when he did this This. But, you know, I started listening and stepping out from all the emotional response that you're we're getting, all the emotional and the anger about Elon, and just listen to the product story, whether it's been the ability to start to link personal and business accounts together, whether you're starting to see the ability for it to track. And by the way, I love the data, and sometimes I hate it because when my tweets get a lot of action and I see great numbers, I love it. And when they kind of just pass through the stream without much engagement, I'm sad and bitter that people can see how poorly my tweet has performed. Um, I'm li looking at some of the infrastructure things he's been able to do. Because by the way, to get real-time stats, he said it was something like 3 million operations per second or something that needs. So his ability to update product features, infrastructure, and Twitter's humming. I mean, I know everybody's really pissed, but it's Mastodon's not going to be a thing. I'm just going to tell you that. And Elon Musk may actually, God, I know everyone, you know, people hate him right now. And I know it's all political, but he's good at product. I think Twitter might actually be better um, in 2023. What's your thoughts, Pat? So I think that Elon was looked at as a savior for saving the planet uh, with its Tesla cars. And he was given accolades and he was on the front covers of magazines. Uh, but now that he comes in and kind of shows that he's more of a centrist, then he is getting uh, he's getting attacked, which doesn't surprise me a bit. The challenge, though, is it's, it's going over to the attitudes of Twitter. There's nothing that Elon Musk said about what to expect from from Twitter that's not actually happening. In fact, he went out of his way to say. We're going to be making a lot of changes. We're going to screw up th some things. Okay. Give us a little bit of grace uh, on that. And he outed what people said weren't happening. In fact, Jack up on Capitol Hill said that shadow banning wasn't happening. But in fact, it was happening. And that really is irritating uh, a bunch of, of the folks who tend to uh, lean, lean left. So here's the guidance that I'm giving on, on Twitter to brands, which is go where your users are. If your users are getting out of Twitter, then the importance for you to be on there is, is going down. Um, if they're still on Twitter, I don't know, half of them, three quarters of them, uh, you need to stay on Twitter because your competitors likely will. I mean, what are you going to do? Take your take your thing to a mastodon that, you know, gosh, if I hear, you know, whether it's on the right or on the left, hey, we're going to build this new, you know, what is that, like the truth social or something? Um, that That's not doing uh, 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 very well. Let's build platforms, Pat, to make sure that there's never any discourse. Let's just only, let's just build echo chambers now, right? No, I think that I, I think that sounds terrible, right? So, um, if you're a brand, I mean, get off at your own. Um, you know, uh, uh, beware. W what are you going to go to? Uh, something that is is run by the Chinese uh, that you have an even less percent of chance of probably getting uh, what you what you want. So. Anyways, be careful out there. I, I think at the end of 2023, Twitter will be looked at. It'll, it'll be so boring because it will be successful and people will come back to the platform that we won't even be we won't even be talking about. It. So if I could just say one more thing, this is a little out of school for me, but hell, maybe 23 will be a new year for me. 
when you're reading these files, okay, the things that have been released, and I know a lot of people, but to me, isn't there a point where we all kind of have to look at ourselves and say, it's possible that two things are happening, both of which I agree or disagree with, and they can be politically opposite. For instance, you could say Donald Trump, Trump played a part of inciting a coup or a, a hostile or whatever you want to call it, an insurrection. And you could actually look at the media, look at the news, look at the story, look at the data and say, that happened. You could also look at these files about COVID that have come out and say, that's scary that they went to such lengths to try to hide um, potential information from uh, the population that was being provided by real credible experts in the field because it simply didn't go along. And what I'm saying is it's weird how like you can't, and, and in this case, see both things. And that's to me like, feels like how we arrive at the center is at some point you have to be able to realize that people on the right and the left do things both right and wrong. <laughs> it's not always, you know, just one side and people will completely, we talked about it with the Apple and China Pat, because people want their iPhones and they right now happen to maybe see a different dictator as the problematic one, we completely give a pass to the other. Yeah. And my point is, can't we see both as bad? or good, or one is good, you know what I mean? But I don't know, it's very interesting to me that we've lost the ability for nuance, lost the ability for subjectivity in these kinds of things. When I see both of these, in both of those examples as problematic. Yeah, that would, be, that would be great. And I did grow up in a world where, thank goodness that there was nuance and there was discussion um, and, there was common belief and common uh, view on something that, that brought the country together. So I, I am hoping that will come in 2023, but quite frankly, I, I just, I think there's like a 0% of, of that happening. There have been, if you look historically over 500 years and society's abilities to gel, it either comes at a huge uh, weather event a war or a sickness event. And we took COVID and we actually turned that into a way to bifurcate even more than, than we were before. And the two other, I mean, the war thing is just too awful to think about because it would likely be a conflict with China or a nuclear war with, uh, with Russia. So anyways, I, I'm going to try to do what I can do to be as balanced as I possibly can uh, and, and look at it from, from all sides critically, right, with fact uh, and history and, and things like that. And I'll admit, sometimes I get sucked in, in multiple directions at the same time. But, Dan, this is a great kickoff to 2023. Let's not, uh, let's not yeah. end on, uh, let's not hey, end on let's nuclear war. Let's, let's let's talk about something exciting, Pat. We like, are we are off. There's our there's our guy Connor Kenyon. Big things. We are off tomorrow to CES. You and I, where the six five will be live on the road. We'll be doing um, a number of different episodes. Uh, we'll share more from our accounts over the next few days. Qualcomm, Luminar. Who else we got, Pat? Any 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 others that will be uh, in the? Booth? Yeah, we've got uh, we got Micron. Uh, as well, which I'm excited um, about. And we'll be also doing maybe some daily shorts, you and I, hopping on, doing some videos with our puts and takes on everything that we've seen and saw. And so, look, 2023 is going to be a great year. We've got the 6-5 Summit back in June. Back, baby. Uh, we've got uh, CES. we got Mobile World Congress coming up. We've got a slate of events and shows. We've got some Go Big Partners. They're going to be getting, uh, we're going to be seeing a lot more of us at a lot more events. And Pat, there's some other really big things in our universes that are going on. We we'll want to share more with all of you very shortly. However, for this episode, for the first and the best of 2022, and a look at it to 23, it's time to say goodbye to y'all. Hope you hit that subscribe button, stick with us, be our friends, look at all those impressions Pat's driving on his tweets, on his Twitter, at Patrick Moorhead. 
and retweet mine so I get those same numbers as well. But for this episode, time to say goodbye. See you later. Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome to 2023.